Welcome to another edition of Dead Air Live. Heal yourself, heal the planet. Tonight I'd like to introduce you to Joe Lucier, who's a living food coach, a raw food chef, a healer, a Chinese translator, and a software engineer. Welcome, Joe. So happy to have you here. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Joe, what is raw, living, organic food? Raw, living, organic food is fresh, whole food from nature. Fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and sea vegetables, all in its natural state, all totally full of veg uh, vitamins and minerals and nutrients, all fresh from nature, fresh from a farm, fresh from your produce market, and just vibrant with life and energy. It's delicious food, and it's unprocessed, uncooked, and just ready to, ready to eat in a beautiful way. Joe, you're the founder of Raw New England Community. What is RNEC? I've been to some of the events. They are fabulous. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Raw New England Community is a, is a group of people that are all interested in the whole foods, raw living foods lifestyle. One of the important components of having that successful for people is that they get together and they share ideas, they share food. We usually have big potlucks, and as you've seen, we've had up to 100 people. The other goal of the community is to have information and education about why this is so good, why it's so healthy, what's the science, and to share great ideas so people can enjoy it together. Community is very important, and over the last few years, I've learned that that's very important. And that's why I created the, the Rod New England community, to bring people together that weren't together originally so they can share these great ideas. And it's a wonderful time to be together. It's a celebration of life. It's a celebration of food, healthy nutrition food, because people go, come out of this event, they're very happy. When people leave the event, they're motivated, they're inspired, and they basically see, wow, I can do this, this is great, and this is why. And these are other people sharing in the great experience. It's tremendous. It's really exciting Thank to you. get them all together. Thank you for finding such a great organization. Joe, where does one get their organic vegetables? Because everyone lives in different parts of the world. The best places to go is right to the farm. And there's a couple of ways to do that. One is you can actually work on a farm and share in the farm itself. You can buy from their, their market, market stands and get as local, as close to your home as possible. Local is the best. The other way is to, like I do in my local produce store, they only sell organic produce. And they get it from local markets from Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts, and Vermont. So that's where I go for my primary source of organic produce. Right. Well, I understand that there's a lot of CSAs, which means community supported agriculture, that's being all around all around the country. I think we have a clip of that that we'd like to see. Brookwood Community Farms, which was fantastic, by the way. I went out there one day and very, very pleased with what I saw. So. Yes, yeah. and, and I understand you used to work there. I actually was, that, I've worked in a couple of different farms, this and I worked there briefly. This farm is a community farm that is uh, in its third year of operation. We use state land uh, to grow food for local people in the Boston and surrounding suburban area. Um, and we try to, and our goal is to make food accessible to everybody and to involve local people in farming here at Brookwood. We are harvesting today for our community supported agriculture program um, and the way that that works is we have about a hundred members who essentially purchase or share in the farm and then um, every week come and pick up um, a box full of whatever we've harvested that week so um, right now we're actually finishing up our garlic harvest and we've got um, pounds and pounds of garlic that we're bringing in and we've also harvested um, eggplant and cucumber and beans today and are going out and doing some herbs so we have a whole um, group of high school interns who are working here for the summer. The garlic comes out of the ground just like this and you can peel it to make it look nicer like this and you can basically eat it whenever, but um, we're gonna dry it so it lasts longer, so we can keep giving it to people for a long time. It basically lasts forever if it's dried. And, yep. 
<laughs> um, so we're getting ready for the CSA shares to be picked up and they're community supported agriculture so at the beginning of the season people buy a share and each week they get vegetables so I'm writing down um, on cards we have different kinds of peppers uh, how hot they are so people will know what kind of peppers they want so some people like them really hot and some people don't like them as hot that way people can know what they're going to get. Um, just pick two buckets of tomatillas, uh, see, uh, out in the field there, and we're, this is the first time we've picked the tomatillas. There's lots of them ripening, and we will put them on our farm stand for farm members today to take home and make some salsa verde. These are all tomatoes behind me from uh, probably about a quarter acre from there over to there, and I'm gonna see if there's any red ones. So we have, um, I believe it's about six varieties of eggplant and for most of the crops that we're growing, um, we have multiple varieties. So that's one thing that makes it really different from doing your grocery shopping at a grocery store where you go to get tomatoes and there really may only be one variety. But we have about, I think 15 to 20 varieties of tomatoes and several varieties of eggplant, a couple different varieties of cucumber. So um, you really get to see that um, for each vegetable, there's a lot of different kinds of flavors and textures that you could get even within the same kind of vegetable. Um, we're located in Massachusetts, in Boston, and we make farmers markets at um, Mattapan in, in um, Boston, and we also make markets in Milton, too. So those are the only places, places where we do markets at. So. Um, Wherever you're from, you know, you can swing by any time whenever we have a market. Joe, where, what do people have to pay to for a share from CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. If I wanted to do this, how much would it cost me for a season between, I think, May and October? Is that correct? That's the general season. Right. And the CSA that we just saw, I worked there briefly at the beginning of the season, and I think that one is about $500 or $600 for a whole season. Right. But that gives you an, uh, an amazing amount of fresh organic produce. Right. You get a great big basket every week and then that's for about 20 weeks usually. So a full share you can buy for usually five to six hundred dollars depending upon the farm. You can get a half share for half as much as that or you can actually work for a share. So you can actually oh, participate. You can work. Oh, I love that. Yeah, so a lot of those people that you saw there, they're actually working for their share. They're not paying cash money but they're doing their time in the farm and paying just with their sweat equity to receive the benefit, to receive a share. I was also told too that if you're gonna have vegetables, it's always best, or fruits, to have what is in season because your body, it's better for your body, is that true or? That's, that's really true because that's how we sort of adjust, our body adjusts at different times of the year. As it gets colder, you wanna have more solid foods, more warming foods. In the summer, you want more light foods and more water-filled foods and more you know, vibrant kind of foods in the summer. So those are the different types of things and they're available each season. As the season goes through, buy what's local and buy what's in season, it's perfect. Okay, well this past weekend I had the great opportunity to spend a little bit of time at Amy and Denny Perrin's place in York, Maine. And uh, I was fascinated, they don't have a stove. They don't own a stove, everything's done with dehydrators but I think we should check out this clip of Amy and Denny Perrin because they have quite an extraordinary life and they are living the life of raw 
Living Organic Food Experts, and it's fantastic. Okay. So let's, let's check that out. Then we have some dandelions. We like okay. to put that in our, our green juice. Monstrous salad. Big, big salads. And, and then our, we have a green juice every day. So a lot of this will be going into the green juice. And if you juice cilantro, it'll clean out heavy metals. Money well spent. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, we can juice the, these tops. Yeah. You said one bunch of arugula? Yes. So we're going to put the radishes on our salads and we'll juice the top so we get to eat the whole thing. Okay, we just got back from the last day of the farmer's market in October. So we've picked up mostly all the greens um, that we need for the week. And we've got lots of lettuces, gorgeous lettuce from our farmer, Bill. Lettuces, he gave us some carrot tops. They're part of the, they're from the parsley family. We can put those in our green juices. Got some gorgeous radishes and beets. And we also got some whole carrots that have the bottoms and the tops. And um, arugula. To put in salads, probably. And some dandelion, which is a very good liver cleanser. We'll put that in our green juices for several days this week. OK, so you'll see lots of different colors in these vegetables. So you got the red of the radishes and in the uh, different lettuces and lots of greens and even the white from the onions. Onions are high in sulfur and it's, it's good to have some white vegetables in the beta carotene and the in the carrots and it's uh, green is good to get you a lot of chlorophyll. Uh, different colors in the Swiss chard and it's just good to get a variety. And each color does mean something, but we need all the nutrients. So you don't want to leave out any colors. You want to take them all in as much as you can. You, you'll see that there's a predominance of green. And to the raw foodist, green is great because green means chlorophyll. And chlorophyll um, is chemically almost identical to our blood very little difference between hemoglobin and its biochemistry and chlorophyll. So that's why raw foodists uh, gravitate more and more towards greens and green foods because it contains so much blood rich nutrients. I just thought it would be um, worth a couple of words about why fresh food is so important um, for anybody but in the life of a raw foodist Fresh is best, so we want to try to get the food as fresh as possible. Most of this food was picked today from the garden. It's still nutrient rich and enzyme rich is so important, the enzymes, because when we eat the food, the food contains all the enzymes that we need to digest it. And then we don't have to expend our own enzymes digesting the food. Our enzymes can go towards cleaning up our joints and our organs and making sure that our body's functioning properly. Now, once the food is picked and taken from the garden, it's going to begin its natural process of degradation. So what we want to do is slow that process down as much as possible. So we want to get this food into the refrigerator, keep it at a cool temperature, and it'll last longer and we'll get the maximum benefit from it. So that's the idea now is to get the food um, packed up and put in the refrigerator so that it'll be as fresh as it can be when we get to it. Hanging out in our favorite room in the house, the kitchen, where it all happens. Um, here's, a, here's a cool thing. This is really cool. Nature has this amazing design about the way things work, right? I mean, we love that. And anybody that pays attention to the natural world learns about that. One of the coolest things is that when nuts and seeds go into a dormant state, like they come off the tree and they fall on the ground or whatever. And they, they go into a dormant state and they can sit for years and years and years in this dormant state. Well, they found uh, some kind of wheat in like the Egyptian tombs exactly. that lasted for thousands of years. Thousands of years. Because they have... Well, I'm going to get to that. Okay. Because m most foods, okay, if you, if you pick a piece of fruit off the tree or whatever, you know, it starts to deteriorate. and 
and the enzymes within that food will literally devour it within a few days. It rots, that's what they call rotting. But seeds and nuts are different, and grains. They have a built-in enzyme inhibitor, and this substance prevents the enzymes from becoming activated so that these foods can sit in their dormant state literally almost forever. However, here's the downside of it. If we go to eat one of those foods without first doing something about that enzyme inhibitor, when we take that food into our body, not only are we preventing digestion of that particular food, but we're actually inhibiting some of the enzymes that are in our bodies now we're bringing that enzyme inhibitor into us and it starts to compromise our own enzyme activity. So I want to clarify this. You're talking about just like a raw sunflower seed, a raw almond. Um, Grains, anything. Anything that's, that's um, just in its raw state. Dormant, raw state, dormant. However, if we were to take the time to soak these foods in water, simple germination, and allow them to germinate and become alive again. And it only takes, in most cases, overnight for most of these foods. When we soak them in water, the enzyme inhibitor then leaves the food. It's no longer necessary. The food wakes up, the, the, the nut or the seed wakes up and says, oh, it's time to grow again. And the enzyme inhibitor is out of the picture then we can eat that food. And it's been germinated. Right. We can eat that food. We can take it in. We can digest it fully. We're not compromising our own enzyme activity. And we get to use the enzymes present in that food to aid in digestion and to maximize our nutritional intake. So it's a win-win for everybody. If you can soak the food, take the time, soak it. You can even then dehydrate it. Once you've soaked it and activated it, you can then dehydrate it and make it crunchy again, and you still have, you know, the benefit of it. So that's a mother nature, good job. Well, and the whole purpose of the enzyme inhibitor is so that, you know, it's going to stay um, usable. It's going to stay around until, and, and what happens is the fruit may, maybe it falls on the ground, and then the rains come and the soil is damp, and then it can grow into a right. tree and that's the whole purpose of it otherwise if there's no moisture it can last forever right but um it's a great system but that's we've great. learned to use that to like make sprouts right. these are now living and whereas before when they were dry and i hadn't soaked them or sprouted them they were just dry they wouldn't have done me my body any good but now we have um you know sprouted buckwheat that I'm going to be making cereal out of later. It's a perfect example of what we were talking about earlier, how nutritional science in general is concerned primarily with macronutrients, the carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. So if you were to take this buckwheat in its, nat in its dormant state like it was before, and let's say you were going to grind it into a flour and make some kind of food out of it, you would be able to extract from it carbohydrate, protein, and maybe a little bit of fat, but that would be all you would get from it. And your body would have to work very hard just to, to process that food. Now you've taken that food and you've turned it into a living food again, right? So you can still get some of those macronutrients, but you get so much more. You get that matrix of living food, living organisms, all kinds life of life force life force that just explodes in your body and gives you everything you need. It's just a tremendous transformation and it takes so little effort. Just soak it, let it drain a little bit, let it start to sprout and grow that little tail and you've got a living food. It's awesome. What else can I say but have fun? Okay. <laughs> Feels great. It does That's feel amazing. great. Although my feet are now about numb at this point. Joe, I was just there this weekend. And since I've been there, all I've been consuming is living foods. You'll be very proud of me. 
I came home with a big basket of stuff from Amy's Living Magic. Good morning. And uh, I'm just, I'm just so jazzed up. I have more energy. And it's just, thank you. Because you've been telling me about this, but now after being there and having all this wonderful food, I don't know what else to tell you. Thank you. What, what a great gift. But they talked about sprouts. They talked about living foods. Can you elaborate a little bit more about that? Sure. Living foods are actually alive. They're actually growing. So what they were saying, which made a lot of sense, was that you, once you remove those enzyme inhibitors, you can actually grow these, you know, these plants, and then they're actually starting to grow and they're becoming alive, like sprouts, like bean sprouts, alfalfa sprouts, all these different types of sprouts. And then they're, they're alive and they're actually growing. And then when you eat them, you gain all of that vitality, all of those vitamins and minerals, enzymes, and all those things. So you get that great benefit. So that's what you want to do with live, raw, live, living foods. You want to g take advantage of that, that state of aliveness, that life force that's in that food at that moment. And it's great. And the reason you feel better is because you're getting this energy from the food. The body doesn't have to take up resources to process it because, as you said, Mother Nature has a really good design. And it's built in all the enzymes and all these things into this beautiful package. So when you get it, the body is ready for it. It's familiar with it and you get all this extra energy and you don't have to take up resources to try to process something foreign or something difficult like junk food or whatever. So is that why when people eat, they get really tired and they yawn? It's because they're trying to process the processed food and when you have living food, you don't have to go through that, that tired state. Oh, I need to take a nap. That doesn't happen, exactly. it, it, right? Exactly, well, two things. One is if you eat food that the body's never seen before, like a Twinkie or something like that. Oh, I used to like those when I was young, no okay. more. But any, anything like that is really hard for the body to digest because basically it's been created in a laboratory. So number one, it, it, it's difficult to recognize and it has to be processed in a special way and it's got a lot of very unfriendly things for the body. Number two, that food has no enzymes. So the body has to use its own resources, its own enzymes, pull them out of its pool and to actually digest this foreign kind of substance. When you eat raw living foods, it's already there. It's already efficient. It's going to give you everything really quick, and it's going to be brought right into your body right away, and it's not going to have to really figure it out, try to find out, you know, how does this body, you know, work on a Twinkie. It can figure out how to process regular foods easily. So was man designed to have eat plants, drink plants, or eat meat? Because when we first... G g genetically, didn't we used to eat meat? Technically, you can ask Darwin. According to Darwin, we are frugivores. We are vegetarians. We are. We are. We're actually, technically, we are vegetarians. And we're built that way, and there's a few reasons. One is our teeth are built that way to eat a plant-based diet. Our digestive system, which is extremely long, is built to manage a plant-based diet. And remember, the other people, the other animals, like the apes, the chimps, the elephants, they're vegetarians. And they're big and strong. They're very strong. Look at, you, you know, I wouldn't tack, you know, tackle an ape or anything like that. I wouldn't tackle an elephant either. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine, they eat vegetarian, mm. and they are our nearest ancestors. And that's what we are. Our b physiology is basically the same as theirs. And there are many other reasons. We actually don't have certain chemicals in our body to process meat. Carnivores do. So when we get it in our body, we don't have enough hydrochloric acid and different things, and it can take oh, okay. more resources and more processing, and it can take up to 80 hours to process meat. 80 hours? So imagine that you eat a hamburger or something like that. It can take up to 80 hours to go through your system. So imagine it's in there. It's, it's actually putrefying. It's, it's sort of fermenting. Ooh. The body's trying to process it. And, it, and it's stinky. And, and, <laughs> I just, and I just found out recently <laughs> that global warming, a lot of 40% of global warming, and by the way, I could be wrong about the statistics, is caused from cows. Actually, it takes more resources. Methane gas. Methane gas. In places like Australia, they have a certain taxes against so many animals for the methane gas production. But actually, if you, there was a really funny quote that I heard actually just today. Please do share. <laughs> <laughs> a vegan in a Hummer is, is better for the planet 
for, for global warming than a vegetarian in a hybrid. A vegan in a Hummer. A vegan in a Hummer. Hummer. You're talking about the car is better for yeah. the planet than a vegetarian in a hybrid. The bottom line is, is if you go to a plant-based system for your economy, it takes less resources to grow plants than to raise cattle. Excellent. So it could be as many as six to ten times more efficient to grow plants and feed okay. people plants than to feed people, feed plants to cattle, to feed cattle to humans. Okay. So I just want you to know also that I've been doing wheatgrass every day and I've been getting my wheatgrass from Randy J Jacobs who is Life Force Growers. And mm -hmm. that was the last thing that Amy and Denny Perrin were talking about were sprouts, sprouting. So I'd love to check out that clip and show you what we found out with, uh, with Randy Jacobs. Great. Good morning. My name is Randy Jacobs. I'm a director of Life Force Growers and I want to welcome you to our organic grow room. What a wonderful place to, to invite you to be and to share a whole life's worth of what lies in store for all of us. Wheatgrass is such a powerful opportunity for me to be able to elevate my body's ability to protect me. All of what the body needs, all of the raw materials, oxygen and hydrogen, amino acids, are all contained in its most abundant source in grasses, living, organic, raw material from which life is presenting you everything that you need in order to protect and elevate your ability to reproduce for cells, for growth, for rejuvenation. Everything that your body needs is contained in abundance in its most abundant form right here in live grasses and sprouts. Good morning. And this is the way that I start my morning. By taking fresh, raw, organic, living wheatgrass, still in the tray, cut it, and it's nature's abundance right from the soil into my body in less than two minutes. Isn't it amazing? When was the last time you were able to go out into your garden and to take a vegetable and cut it out of the earth and bring it in and get it in its most concentrated form into your body? Well, that's what we do on a daily basis. Wheatgrass is a complete living food. Everything that the body needs in terms of a metabolic process and all of the things that your body needs are contained in cereal grasses. And by juicing them, we are extracting the essence, the concentrated life force energy out of raw cereal grasses into a juice and into our body. And I'm gonna put it through our juicer here. Isn't it amazing that wheat seed, the seed from which we grow these plants, is able to extract the highest level of nutrients from the soil of any seed. Some 96 different nutrients out of the soil, out of the 106 or so available. And look how quickly we can provide what has really been called the nectar of life to your health. It's so yummy. It's so good. I invite you to try this. You know, Joe, I'm looking at one of the cameramen. He's squinting and making all these funny faces. And uh, the taste is a little bit intense. Wheatgrass. But once it goes down, it's like, zoom! You're ready to like just take off. It's like jet fuel. Am I right? Absolutely. Uh, wheatgrass is so packed full of vitamins and nutrients and energy, it goes right into your cells. It's just like... Into your blood or to your cells? Or is the blood and the cells the same? 
Pretty much the same. They are, Pretty okay. Yeah. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be so efficient, and it's going to go right into your body, and basically your body is just going to be ecstatic. Wow, this is great. I can do anything with this. I can heal. I can build. Mm -hmm. I can do everything. You know, and as I said earlier in the clip, it's basically so similar to blood. It's like a blood builder. It's an immune builder, and it's really tremendous. It's one of the most efficient foods, and one of the things in all of the healing centers that I've ever been to to train or practice or to see, wheatgrass is always there because it's so efficient and it's so healing. It is actually a regular regimen for all healing practice that I've ever seen in any, any healing school that I've ever been to. And a lot of people don't know when they go and get their smoothies or their power drinks, a lot of people have wheatgrass and they'll put a shot of wheatgrass right into the power drink. But what I don't really know, is it better to have the wheatgrass alone or is it better to have the wheatgrass with something else? Because the taste is very, it's intense. It is intense. Yeah. It takes a little while to get used to, but the best way to take wheatgrass is on an empty stomach. Oh, okay. Because it, it'll get mixed, it, it'll get diluted. If you really want the best bang from your wheatgrass, take it first thing in the morning, and then you, you'll really be bang, you know, filling your body full of very good nutrients right away. It'll be the most efficient. So do I you? suggest doing that. Do you do wheatgrass every day? Right now, I'm not doing it every day, but when I can, I grow it, and then I drink, drink it first thing in the morning. Oh, so you grow it yourself? You do a shot. I see. Okay. So a <laughs> shot is like two ounces? A shot is one or two ounces. Because I'm up to like four ounces. You're doing great. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's outrageous. It's, it's a lot of wheatgrass. <laughs> so tell us about the healing that people can get when they do foods that are living, organic, raw foods. The, the best benefit of healing raw living foods is that it feeds your body what it needs. The body is in a constant state of trying to maintain itself and regenerate itself. So the, the, the last thing we want to do is interfere with that process. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to feed the body what it needs to do to regenerate. The body and nature will do all the work. We just need to get out of the way. So the best thing the body needs is what it's used to, what is efficient, what is healthy, what is vital, what is full of life force energy. So that's what it does. So when your body receives this type of food, the immune system gets built up. Your immune system gets stronger. You can fight off disease. You can be so strong. You can be so healthy so easily on a regular basis. And your body is just doing what it was built to do. It's an amazing machine, what nature has done. And all it needs is the resources to do that. When you feed it something that's difficult, it takes up resources. It makes it difficult. It makes it slow. It makes you want to take a nap after eating. Right. It makes you want to sleep too much. Different things like that. When you right. do this, the body is ready. The body will take it in. It will build your immune system. It will build your tissues. And everything that you need is in this type of food. I recently met someone. Her name is Dorothy. And Dorothy has a compelling story how she was able to heal herself from cancer from uh, t having a living alkaline diet. So we have a clip of Dorothy. If we can uh, check that out, that would be great. My name is Dorothy Torrey. I'm from East Sandwich on Cape Cod, a place that I love to live, and I'm very blessed to be there. And the reason that I'm here is to let people know that there are other options out there. Um, I used to be scared of cancer, like many other people. And if someone had cancer, out the door, I would go. And um, it wasn't until I had the diagnosis that I'm very surprised that I have chosen an entirely different path. And I so desperately needed to be needed by someone. And I was 24 years old when I got married, so it's not like, like being 18 years old. So, far. so I did get very sick in that uh, relationship. And um, thank goodness, uh, by the grace of God, that somehow I started, I went to Al-Anon meetings, because those, that is for people who are affected by other people's drinking. And um, I started to work on myself. My as I call it, my stinking thinking. And, um, and the people in Al-Anon accepted me for who I was, and they loved me for who I was, and my thinking was really, really very distorted at that time. I did decide to divorce my husband because I knew that if I stayed in that relationship, the disease would have gotten me. 
um, I would have been dead because there was no, uh, he was doing no recovery work. So um, that's, that's that. But um, I, I remarried and uh, my uh, second husband is a, is a great man. I did uh, get uh, suicidal depression. This was before the cancer. I was diagnosed with suicidal depression because I still wanted people to like me, okay? And I didn't heal that part of me yet. And I would do things and just exhaust myself and um, for other people or for the community and just, um, I, I got into suicidal depression and I was on medication and I couldn't stop the negative voices in my head. They just kept on going and going from morning to night, couldn't stop them. And what happened to me, uh, I called up a spiritual coach and um, I told her I'm, I'm at the, at the, in despair, in total despair. And I thought that if I could just accept the fact that I was in despair, that through acceptance, my life would become easier because that's what I, I learned, okay? And um, she introduced me to alkalinity. And she said, Dorothy, why don't you try alkalizing? I followed what the rest of the doctors were saying, but at the same time, um, I, I always started, I, for 30 years, I've been looking for answers in health. Okay, I had trouble with my knees, I had trouble with thyroidism, I had severe migraines. I would go to the health store, I would look at alternatives, I would go to homeopaths, always looking for health, okay? And so, um, uh, with the suicidal depression, I tried so many things, nothing worked. Uh, my friend introduced me to alkalizing. The day that I started alkalizing, I never needed another medication in my life. What was happening was that I did spend two weeks in a hospital and they told me that I could never, never get off my medication for the rest of my life, that I had a chemical imbalance. Um, I had two specialists up in Maine and then I came back to Cape Cod and I had a specialist up in Boston that I would go see. They said, you can never get off your medication. My medication made me feel brain dead and I, and I wanted to get off of it, but again, nothing was working. But the day I started alkalizing, just like that, it was like, wow, I couldn't believe it. What, what happened, I was feeling so, so terrible about the medication that um, I, I got in touch with the doctor and he said to stop taking the medication for three days and start up again. Well, it was just at the time that my friend introduced me to the alkalinity. And I was on the depression pills for six years. So, okay. So I started studying alkalinity. I started studying the root causes of illness and disease. I started studying with Robert O. Young. And um, I went to uh, see him talk when he was in Connecticut. He lives in Valley Center, California. And uh, lo and behold, I thought I understood so much about alkalinity. What I didn't know, I understood this much. I was just the tip of the iceberg. So uh, in, um, a year later, I come down with a diagnosis of cancer. I never thought that I would get cancer because I thought that I understood alkalinity. And um, I did hear a testimony of someone that heal themselves of cancer by alkalizing. I know that uh, disease and illness does not live in an alkaline environment. Uh, Dr. Otto Warburg received two Nobel Prizes in medicine and saying that, not one no, mo no, Nobel Prize, but two. Okay, disease doesn't grow in an alkaline environment. Okay. So um, when I went to, to visit the uh, leading hospital in Boston, um, because my uh, 
doctor said, you must, you know, because of a diagnosis, oh, you must go to, why don't you go to Boston? It's so close, it's the best. Um, I did go see the doctor there, and she wanted to do lumpectomy, radiation, chemotherapy, and drugs. I decided it just didn't make sense to me. Not because of understanding the root causes of illness and disease, it, there was no fear in me, it just, didn't make sense what they wanted to do. And I said, no, I'm going to do the alkalinity. It was um, challenging in, in the beginning, uh, but I loved the food that I was eating. See, I knew that I had to also address my lifestyle and my thinking. When I, um, I used to have my blood work, well, when I dry blood and live blood analysis, where they would prick my finger and I would see the conditions of my red blood cells on a monitor and see if there's any bacteria, yeast, fungi, or mold in it. Okay. My red blood cells were not changing fast enough. They were still compromised. And it wasn't until I addressed my lifestyle and my thinking more that my red blood cells were changing. And um, what is what was most supportive, I was going to Unity Church of the Light on Cape Cod, and I heard that uh, God lives within, that we are magnificent human beings, that, uh, and I started getting this connection uh, of who we are. We are phenomenal, phenomenal human beings. Every cell in our body is devoted and dedicated to healing. I started reading the books of uh, The Biology of Belief by Bruce Lipton, The Divine Matrix by Greg Braden. So, yeah. And I started uh, the um, Evolving Your Brain by Dr. Joe Dispenza, done some workshops. And um, I've come home to myself. I've come home to myself and I'm smiling and laughing because I truly love myself. I truly am so grateful for this most magnificent journey. I will never call myself a survivor. I will never call, say that I fought cancer because how would you feel if I fought you? You know, or, or, or beat up or so forth. It's, it just doesn't work. Um, I've embraced the diagnosis. It's not even my cancer. I, I, I saw this diagnosis in my red blood cells, and I said to it, you, you know, you're beautiful because it looked like green crystals. I said, but you cannot stay in my body. I'm going to turn you over to angels because they will know exactly what to do with you because I don't, but you cannot stay there. And I also, told myself that I choose to be a fast learner. In fact, I told myself that I choose to learn in light years. And if the universe, if the God source wants me to process something, that it will give me that. And I just decided to believe this because the other I believed for 60 years and it didn't, it gave me all my suffering. And I just walked out of that box and I decided no more suffering, that I'm going to fake it until I made it that we are magnificent human beings. I will surrender now like this because the benefits that I receive are so huge. I, and I call it a sweet surrendering. I just say, yes, it's so sweet. It's so wonderful to surrender and I believe with all my heart, with all my heart, and every cell in my body knows this, that because I alkalized, I cleaned up my inner terrain, I got rid of the yeast, fungi, mold, that my vibration will rise, and that an, an inner wisdom is there now. My intention is to teach other people to alkalize, because when you're alkaline, you feel grounded, you come from a place of cooperation, not competition. Just like we take a bath on the outside, 
And you know, when's the last time have we taken a bath on the inside? All the accumulation of toxins and so forth. And so I have cleansed my inside and I love doing it. Uh, I, I love the beautiful um, clean food that I eat. And I say that we are live bodies. How come we give ourselves dead food, okay? I'm, I'm alive. I know that a cancer cell vibrates at 52 megahertz and a healthy red blood cell vibrates at a 70 megahertz. Yet most of our diet is zero to 50, okay? And I give myself foods that are higher vibration. And because of this, I actually have states of blissfulness that like, wow. And I used to be suicidal, deep depressed. And I know, I, I can tell every cell in my body uh, that they're, I mean, I know that they're all happy, jumping up for joy, because I've come home to myself. I've come home. There's no cover. There's nothing that I have not unconcealed. I can go any place in my head and feel completely freedom. But I know that we are magnificent beings, that we are divine reflections of this God source, whatever you want to name it. Um, I have no um, anger at my husband. I'm sad about what has happened. But there's complete forgiveness, complete letting go. I bless him. Um, it was a very sick, horrible time. But for some reason, this was my path. And I choose to live to 107 or beyond because I've just started my work. And um, I'm writing a book. And it's just phenomenal what comes, what energy comes coming home to yourself coming to your true self. So I would say um, it is phenomenal to have a diagnosis and to embrace it and ask, what do you need to learn? What is it? And not to live your life as a diagnosis. Today, I attract health to me. I do things that, that attract health. I don't look at, at, at doing things that attract sickness. So I actually get more health, more energy, more everything. And so uh, that's it. That's about it. So, Joe, being a vegan, you obviously don't eat any meat, but do you get enough protein? That's the number one question I get asked. Where do you get your protein? And that's the biggest question. And it's in everything that you've seen tonight on, on the videos, every food that you've seen there has lots and lots of protein. You don't need meat to eat protein. That's actually a myth, scientifically proven. Every fruit, vegetable, nut, and seed has protein, protein and plenty of protein. There, almonds are a complete protein. They have all the essential amino acids that build really good proteins. The wheatgrass is a masterful food. It has all the essential amino acids. It has tons of protein. And we don't need an excessive amount of protein. You get plenty of protein from all the food from a raw living foods lifestyle. So how much protein does a person need in an, on, in, having, during an average day? How much protein should someone consume? The statistics show between 50 and 75 grams of protein a day. And how much protein does wheatgrass have, a two ounce shot of wheatgrass? I don't know exactly, but I would guess that that has between 10 and 20 grams of protein. Well, maybe five to 10 grams of protein just in that one shot of wheatgrass. Which is, which is an awful lot. Which is a real lot, but if you, the key is if you eat a wide variety of fresh fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seed, you'll get plenty of protein throughout the day. Now, Brian Clements, who I recently saw, he's the founder of the Hippocrates, Hippocrates Institute in Florida, said that it's very natural for people to eat things from a dehydrator that's taking something that's, I guess, that's all natural, and you basically take the, um, the fluid out of it, right. and then it becomes very chewy. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. What it is is the main concept of raw living foods is that you don't heat food above around 115 degrees because science has proven that that's when the, the enzymes and the nutrients get destroyed. 
So what you can do, using a dehydrator, you can control the temperature to 115 degrees or lower, and you can basically bring, pull out water from food, but you'll still maintain all the vital enzymes and nutrients in the food. And one of the reasons you want to do that is because it, it's, it's a type of low-temperature baking. And you can actually be really creative. You can create crackers or breads or lasagnas and all different kinds of things. Pasta. Everyone loves pasta. So what do you do if you have a pasta attack? I know you have something up your sleeve because <laughs> you are a raw food chef. Right. And one of the first things that I wanted to figure out how to make when I went to do raw living foods was pasta. So it's really easy. You can spiralize. You can sort of carve out of a zucchini angel hair pasta or al dente style pasta and then you can cover it with a beautiful marinara sauce. All vegan, all really beautiful tasting. So you can have all the pasta you want. I eat pasta a lot. So I didn't have to give that up. In fact, you don't have to give anything up when you do this type of living foods. That's lifestyle. huge. Now, <laughs> what is a marinara sauce? Give us a recipe. Give us some ingredients. Because when I think of marinara, I think of getting a can of kitchen ready, throwing it into a, to a <laughs> pot, and heating it up. And you're saying you can't do that. So what do you do? Take us through it, please. Okay. For, for a marinara sauce, the basic ingredients are sun-dried tomatoes, because usually you want a nice thick sauce, and that's sort of like the tomato paste. Mm -hmm. Sun-dried tomatoes, lemon, salt, parsley, some plum tomatoes that are really thick, and then you process that, you, you mix that together, and it becomes a really nice thick marinara sauce. And it's it's glorious. Add garlic, whatever you want to add to it. So you're inviting me over for dinner, I take it. Absolutely. I, Thank I'd you. I'd love to make it. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. Great. Super. I can't wait to taste it. Now, do you have a dehydrator yourself? I do. In my kitchen, I also have no stove. I reworked my entire wall so that it would basically be cabinet space and a dehydrator, and that's all I have. So I do have a dehydrator, and I use it a lot. Excellent. Now, I know that we were talking about earlier that there's people that can teach you how to grow herbs and vegetables in a small space that's four feet by four feet. So you can be pretty much, you can sustain your own way of life instead of running off to the supermarket or going to a farmer's market pretty much. Am I correct to say that? You're absolutely right. And I think the ultimate goal would be grow your own. Why not? And one of the challenges, if you live in a city or like I do in Quincy, which is very congested area and have a very small yard. Mm -hmm. In a four by four area, you can produce an incredible amount of produce for yourself or you for, for your family. And I recently met a person who runs a company called Inner City Growers. Inner City Growers. And he is a basically a farming master and a permaculture master, which basically you look at the, the area or the environment and you, you plant according to the terrain that you have, the amount of sun. But he comes into your house, and I'm actually doing it myself. He comes to your house. Right now you're doing it in the winter? I mean, well, it's not yes. winter, but I mean, it's well, we're going towards the winter. I just, planted a, I just planted for another season for the next three months, and there are techniques where you can use cold frames, but there are certain things. What, what kind of frames? Cold frames, which is like an insulation with a couple of layers of glass. Okay. So you basically keep your vegetables warm. Oh, because it's acting like solar because the exactly. sun comes in. It's a solar, little like a little solar right. container, like it's, a little greenhouse. It's like when you go into your car, it could be the middle of the winter, it's a lot warmer because the glass, it warms it up. Exactly. Oh, how terrific. So you're yeah. gonna be growing plants and vegetables? I'm growing them right now, they just started all winter? to come up. Oh, you're killing me, this is great. Winter. Yeah, so all winter long, there are people in Maine that do this. They actually have a complete system where you can grow all year round and, like I say, the best thing, you grow your own and you can grow greens. I'm growing a whole bunch of greens right now right next to my house in my own my Give own me background. an example of what you're growing right now. It's, it's October. It's right. the middle of October. What are you growing? And we're in New England. Okay, mostly kale, mm -hmm. watercress. I'm doing uh, mizuna, mixed greens, some Asian greens. And that's the basic stuff that I'm growing right now. And those are the things that are really hardy, what they call hardy in the winter, winter time. And you're using this to juice. These will be, my main goal is for my salads. These will be my salads primarily, for my greens for my salads, mm -hmm. and for also for juicing. Can you tell me what it's like a day in the life, what you wake up in the morning, what you eat? Take me through a whole day. Okay, an ideal day, yes, if please. I'm not too busy, I make a smoothie, I make what we call a green smoothie for breakfast. So one of the easiest things that people can do when they're transitioning to, say, living in raw foods, they mm -hmm. can make their smoothie. So you put in some fruit, you put in just a little bit of greens, 
And for example, my favorite recipe is it's got figs, it's got sometimes bananas, it's, it has avocados, it has some romaine lettuce, mm. and it has some some soaked some soaked sesame seeds. So when you say smoothie, it's 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 like a big blender. It's a big blended drink, and it's really nutritious. And you put romaine lettuce in there. You make it a what we call a green smoothie. Okay. Okay. So you actually add some greens. Greens go with anything in terms of food combining or any of those techniques. Mm -hmm. So imagine for breakfast you're getting some greens. This is wonderful. Okay. So now do you have a snack or do you just go right to lunch or do you skip lunch? What happens? How many hours in between? Usually three or four hours between that breakfast and my lunch. And a lot of times I would have a salad or sometimes I would have the spaghetti. But if I'm making a salad, I would have a salad and it would have greens, sprouts, sauerkraut, sea vegetables, with a, with a, with a customized homemade dressing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and again, three or four hours and you go to dinner? Or do you not eat dinner? You're not hungry? Oh, later I would eat a dinner. I would have either a pasta or a soup, sometimes just a soup and some crackers, like a corn chowder kind of soup. Crackers? Or... I heard wheat. Is that what you have? No. In fact, Pretty much, most of everything that I make is actually wheat-free and gluten-free. Okay. The crackers I make, and I just finished a batch, are made with flax. So you can take flax and you soak them, and they become sort of a, like a binder, and they become like a, like a spread. And then you use the dehydrator, and after about oh, only 12 hours, they become crunchy, and you have nice, beautiful crackers. Mm -hmm. You this can is, make breads and everything. This is fantastic. I'm getting hungry now. I wish <laughs> I had a big spread of food here. Yeah, we should have made you a lasagna and a coconut cream pie or anything like that. Oh, yeah, that was one thing that the, <laughs> the parents had. They had a, a young coconut. Yeah. I said, what is a young coconut? Is it immature? I don't know. What, what was it? It didn't have any hair on it. And they <laughs> said, you know, it was just like a coconut. And they had all the juice, and they threw it in the uh, into this high-powered smoothie drink. And I was like zooming. <laughs> I mean, I left the house. They were exhausted. I went, oh, my goodness. Yeah. I'm like, I'm so high-powered. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Coconuts are a great food. Coconuts are a great nutritious food. And the coconut oil is actually a great oil. Right. It's actually a healthy fat. Believe it or not. So um, we know how to grow our own things from the inner city growers. We could do that any time of the year. And do you also grow herbs? You can make a little herb garden. Oh, that would be great. And what kind of herbs do you grow? You can make uh, sage, rosemary, different things like that. You can even do in-house, you can do some basil, different things. So you can pretty much do anything. You have it inside, especially by a nice, bright window. Okay, so what is it that you would like to share with us? I guess we're um, I guess we're coming to um, I guess we're coming to a close. Am I right? Yes, we're coming to a close. Okay. Joe, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. We'll have to do part two. Okay. Very soon. Thank you so much, Joe. You're such a lovely guest to have on the show. Thank you very much. It's and been I hope and I hope everyone adopts a living raw, organic lifestyle. Take charge of your life. Do the right things. Be healthy. Right. Thank you. <laughs>